remember that time when graves opened up and dead guys came back to life and just started walking around town? Wait, what? All right, all right. Come on, put your hands together for God today. Yes, I know we've already had some awesome church. God has a fantastic message, man. He's got some stuff. He's just been talking to me on fire. We went to this leadership conference this week, and I mean, I came back just charged up and fired up, and I can't wait to share so much stuff with you over the next few weeks. Uh, today, I was, I was really inspired by my nephew, Holton, to, to share this story. This is one of, uh, this is one of my, my favorite little overlooked parts of the Bible. And most people just skip over this part because we don't know what it means. We don't understand this part of that, that, that we, we, we've been talking about crazy stories. And we, we started off with that time where two bears came out of the wood. God sent two bears out of the woods to maul a bunch of kids is the, what the Bible tells us. Now, that seems like weird. Like, wait, what do you do? God doesn't, he doesn't kill children. What's going on there? And now, if you missed it, go back and, and check it out couple, from a couple weeks ago because, of course, there was a whole lot more going on in that story. The whole moral of that story is, no, these were not regular kids like you're thinking kids. God protects his people, his anointed ones. You don't have to fight your battles for you. He's going to take care of your enemies for you. It's, it was an amazing message. So that's what these are about. It's like these weird stories in the Bible. Like, what? What's going on here? And, and then we dissect and we realize, oh, wow. Man, I didn't realize that was going on. Now I can apply that to my life to be even better. So uh, I met some folks last week. So before, we, before I get into the meat and potatoes of that, I met some folks last week that were from California that were visiting our church. And, and, uh, but I'm not sure if you guys are, are here today. But I've been, I've been meeting several people that have been moving here from, from out of state. Longview is a, is a big, like... Um, I don't know, attractive place. There's a whole bunch of folks moving to East Texas. And, and uh, so it occurred to me, they, don't, they may not know uh, some of the Texas culture and tradition, and we should introduce them to it, all right? So there is uh, something in Texas called a Texas Aggie. And if you're from California, you may not know what, a, what an Aggie is. And so whether you uh, are an Aggie or you, uh, you know, went to... Texas Tech or University of Texas or whatever, I think we can all agree that, that Aggie jokes are pretty popular. Hey, there's this bug flying around this morning. Have y'all seen this thing? What is going on there? It looks like a stinging bug. Y'all keep your eye on it, right? My goodness gracious. It's like, y'all remember that time in the Bible where, <laughs> where he sent hornets? <laughs> we don't want that here, right? Um, somebody uh, pray a a, a curse over that stinging bug, <laughs> let him fall to the ground. Um, so, but anyway, uh, an Aggie is somebody that just went to the university. Uh, no, no, they didn't. They went to uh, they went to Texas A and M University, uh, and Texas A and M University um, is a great college, great school, but it gets uh, it gets a lot of uh, uh, flack because they're an agriculture school, so a bunch of farmers go there, or whatever. So uh, they get teased a lot. So here we go. This Aggie walks into a library, all right? And, and he's with, it, with his buddy, and this Aggie and his buddy, they walk into a library, and the Aggie says to the librarian, I want a cheeseburger, some fries, and a Coke. And his buddy goes, man, what are you doing? This is a library. So the Aggie goes, I want a cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. <laughs> That's a good joke right there. All right. Man, the pastor at this leadership conference told that joke, but he didn't tell it as an Aggie joke. He told it as a, as a Boudreaux joke from Louisiana. And I'm like, man, that'll work as an Aggie joke. I thought it was a lot funnier than y'all thought it was. <laughs> I cracked up for three days on that joke. All right. Anyway, Aggie jokes are pretty fun. But so today, you guys, we, we've been talking about these crazy stories, chariots of fire in the sky and guys living inside a big fish and then getting spit out and all this stuff. Today, we're taking it to a whole nother level. I talked about how science actually can, can support the stuff that happens in the Bible. It, stuff happens, and you can see, like, scientifically, that is possible. It's possible for Lot's wife to have turned into a pillar of salt. Scientifically possible. It was next to the Dead Sea, which is called the Dead Sea because nothing grows there. Nothing grows there because it's salt. And so when these fire, the, these embers and, and the brimstone was hitting the ground and salt was flying up all over the place, scientifically possible. And, and when Moses hit the, 
hit the Red Sea and the seas part. It's actually scientifically possible for that to happen. And when you go back and you look in history, a lot of times the things in the Bible co co uh, exist or, or respond co respond so to speak with with cataclysmic events in Earth's history at that same time. But today I'm going to talk to you about something that is just straight up faith. Science does not support this at all. It is absolutely, it's God, it's God, it's God. Sometimes, sometimes, y'all know I told you last week, I really like to have everything logically laid out for me. But I, that's why my go-to scripture is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, don't lean on your own understanding of things. Just trust God. Just trust him, acknowledge him in everything, and he will make everything all right for you. He's going to straighten out your path. He's going to direct your way. You know, so don't, don't, don't have to have it logically figured out and that's today it doesn't make sense scientifically but it did happen there's historic proof that it happened there's record of it in the bible as well as outside the bible that it actually happened this is a true story so week three dead guys coming out of the graves and walking around town everybody say wait what wait what so we're gonna be in the book of matthew matthew 27 we're going to read verse 45 through 54. If you got your Bibles, turn to Matthew. If you don't know where Matthew is, come to Bible study on Wednesday night. Uh, Matthew's about halfway through the Bible and then a little bit more. Okay? First of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? Matthew 27, 45 through 54. Here we go. Now, from the sixth hour... And to the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the earth. If you don't have your Bible, don't sweat it because it's right there, all right? From the sixth hour, which was about noon, they measured time and their calendar was a little different than ours, so, but, but this, it's, it's about noon, our time. So from noon to three, when it's the brightest part of the day, darkness fell over all of the earth. And Jesus cried out with a loud, agonizing voice. And just so y'all know, when you see the little parentheses in there, this is... Uh, this is the Amplified Bible, which it just means that it went and it took that word like we do often and translated it from the Greek or the Hebrew. What did that word mean in the original language? And so I just went ahead and put it for you right here so you know that it, when it says in a loud voice, the word for that means it was this loud, agonizing voice. That was the Greek word for that. So with this loud, agonizing voice, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in verse 50, Jesus cried out again with a loud, agonizing voice and gave up his spirit, voluntarily, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body and submitting his spirit into the hands of his Father. And at once, the veil of the temple was torn from top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split apart. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep in death were raised to life. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. Now the centurion, the Roman soldiers that were standing guard, and those that were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they then, too, believed. They were terrified and filled with awe and said, truly, this is the Son of God. So, the earth shook when Jesus died. Violent earthquake when he died. If there wasn't proof enough that this guy is Emmanuel, God with us, God walking around on earth. He's full of supernatural stuff. He's already, he's already raised dead people. He's already uh, fed 5,000 people with a, with a boy's lunch. He's already see, had blind people can see, uh, crippled people can walk, deaf people can hear. He's already done all of this stuff to prove who he is and the power of God as if it wasn't enough. At the moment of his death, the earth shook, darkness fell over the world, and rocks split open everywhere and graves were opened up. And then after the resurrection, the graves that were opened up, these dead people came back to life and just started walking around town. Wait, what? That's your wait? What, what is going on? And then the Bible just moves right along with the, with the story of the Bible and it never explains this. Excuse me? What was happening? It's so awesome when you realize what exactly was happening here. There were six 
miracles that took place in this moment. This is fixing to change your life. Somebody in here is not walking out of here the same way you came in here today. This is a tried and true, look how powerful Jesus is, fixing to change your life. So get ready. Open up your heart and let God speak to you today. The first miracle was the midday darkness. The second miracle, if you're taking notes, you don't have to write all these six down. I'm just letting you know the backstory. The second miracle came, it was the supernatural tearing of the veil. Now the veil, some of y'all know, what's the significance of the veil being torn? The veil was the place in the tabernacle that separated the people from entering into the presence of God. It, we'll do a teaching on the tabernacle. It's been a few years since I've done a teaching on the tabernacle, but the, the tabernacle was, was the early church, and it was a tent. It was, it was tent walls without a roof, and then there was some, some furniture in there that was st strategic and for a purpose, but the inner, the inner tabernacle, the inner courts, nobody could go in there but the priest, and they could only get, go in there once a year, and, and there was a veil, there was a curtain that separated man from God in this tabernacle. And when Jesus died, it's very symbolic that the, that the veil of the tabernacle was ripped in two at the moment of his death, signifying we no longer have a barrier between us and God. It was forever ripped in two by his death. Now anybody can enter into the chambers of God. You can enter into the presence of God. Where's the chamber of God? Wherever you sit down and you talk to God. It can be in your Jeep. It can be in your Toyota Corolla. It can be in your swimming pool. It can be by your fireplace. It can be in your elementary school classroom five minutes before them monsters come in on the first day of school. Whatever. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They, they are sweet monsters. All right. I have uh, one of them little monsters at home still. So, All right. Uh, so the third miracle, that's the background of the, of the veil being torn, the curtain being torn. The third miracle was the earthquake and the splitting of the rocks. The fourth miracle is the one we're going to land on today, was the opening of the graves in the vicinity of, of the crucifixion. The fifth miraculous sign was the condition of the empty tomb. And the sixth miracle was the resurrection of all these people who had already died. These six miracles of Calvary are, are what was going on. All of them linked directly to the death of Christ, okay? So here we go. The big takeaway from this are, is the miracle number four, when the graves opened up. That's what we're going to talk about today. Jesus cried out in a loud voice and gave up his spirit at that moment. Everybody say, at that moment. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. We can clearly see that by the means of this earthquake, the graves were opened up. So, so far, there was something that shook on the earth. Science was there. The reason why this, they split is because of the earthquake. Now, what caused the earthquake? The cross, all right? But the earthquake split them all open. We know that there was a graveyard that existed near, near Calvary because of history tells us there. You can, you can go to it and view it to this day. Right? It's there. Since Jesus was laid near, nearby, also in John 19, 4, 41 through 42, we're not going to go there, but just if you're taking notes and you want that, it, it's showing us that there actually was a cemetery. It's proving itself. The Bible proves itself. All right? So Jesus, it says, was laid by, in a nearby tomb when he died. All right? Joseph of Arimathea gave, gave up his tomb nearby. So there was, there was a nearby cemetery. This can be proved. This was deliberately telling us that the graves opened up. Okay, so... Who, whose graves opened up? Who were these people? How come, how come they got to, to get out? Right? Um, what's going on? Who, who were they? So the Bible just tells us, what did the scripture say? The saints. Who are the saints? Who knows who the saints are? Yell it out. Who are the saints? We are. We are the saints. So back then, it wasn't us personally. It wasn't like Sarah and James, and it's talking about you two personally in the Bible. But it's just God's people. That's it. Who got to come out? Just God's people. That's it. There was nothing special about these people. They weren't like, you know, uh, they had done certain things. They were God's people that were in the vicinity. They were those marked by God as future heaven dwellers. These folks are, these are my folks. They love me. They kept my commandments. They proved it in life. God's people. It's important to note, while the graves opened at the moment of his death, the bodies didn't come out of them tombs until after the resurrection on the third day. Now, why is this important to note? 
They came out of the tombs after the resurrection. In, in Matthew 27, 53, put, is that up still? Go to, go to, yeah, it is right there. Coming out of the tombs after the resurrection. So why is it important to show us that? That the graves were opened on Friday, but they didn't get up and walk out till Sunday. Well, what was Saturday in this culture? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. It was against the law for them to fix the rocks and fix the tombs and to go and do anything. So the rocks opened up and the, and, and the tombs were just open and stayed open for a whole day. There was a time period that separated the tombs being open, the graves being open, and w the resurrection. This tells a story. Everyone saw this. It was purposeful. It was intentional. It clearly separates the obstacle being removed from the actual resurrection principle. It, it proved that there is a, a, there, there is a time. What it, what it showed was there's obstacles removed in your life. The obstacles have been removed. The things that are standing in your way, the biggest things that you're facing, they've already been handled and taken care of. Death has already been defeated. The obstacles have been taken care of. But we sometimes hang out in the tomb. We stay in the tomb even though it's been opened up. I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that, about that later. When you get to come out of the tomb is when you completely accept and embrace the resurrection. When you completely accept and embrace the resurrection, your marriage isn't renewed. Your marriage isn't restored. Your marriage isn't refreshed. Your marriage is resurrected. The relationship you have your, with your kid is not a little better. It's not refreshed. The obstacle has already been moved. Everything that you need to restore that relationship with your kid or with your dad or with your wife or whatever worry you have, whatever is going on, it's already been removed. Death has already been defeated. Jesus' work, he says, has been finished already. But we sometimes are, are the only obstacle standing in our way. Because we have to fully embrace the resurrection in order to walk out of our grave, in order to be liberated and set free. So were these earthly, were these people that got up and walked out, were they earthly resurrections? Like were they mortal man, flesh and blood, or were they glorified bodies like Jesus after he came back from the, he was a glorified body. Were these just regular Joes or were they in their glorified body? What do you guys think? Regular Joes. They were just, they were earthly, earthly people. Scripture clearly tells us they were earthly because the stone doesn't need to be moved away to release a spiritual body. This is significant because this tells us, this is a story for us right now, right? This is what it, it's talking about us right now. You are mortal right now. It's telling us your obstacles have been removed their obstacle has been, been removed. You don't have to remove the, tomb, the, the stone if it was a spiritual resurrection. So this tells us it was for mortals, it, which we are it, right now. Currently, we, we operate in the flesh, even though we are not, not of this world. We, we do live in the world. We do have bodies. For us right now, this is what this is talking about. A spiritual body has spiritual properties. A resurrected body. And it tells us that too. Jesus entered the room in John 20, uh, one of the other coolest, coolest stories in the Bible. When Jesus entered the room to talk to the apostles, he just morphed through the walls. He didn't open a door. He didn't come in the natural way. He just appeared. We've all seen movies, you know. Ghosts can move in and out of, in and out of things. Have you seen Ghost where Patrick Swayze stuck his head in the subway and looked around? Like, yep, that's the one I need. And went on in. We don't need the stone be rolled away. When you're in your glorified body, this, this, this kind of resurrection in, in your glorified body doesn't need to stone, stone rolled away. It's just like when, when someone dies on earth, you don't, their spirit going to heaven doesn't need the ceiling to be broke through. You know? So this is what this is telling us. Um, there's a very significant time in our lives when the obstacles have been removed, but we stay in the tomb until this resurrection moment happens. And I'm not talking about the resurrection moment when you die. The resurrection moment is available to us all 
right now. Did the stone on Easter Sunday need to be rolled away for Jesus to get out? Or did it, be, did it need to be rolled away for the disciples to get in? The stones were rolled away for us. All right. So when we hear this story, the dead men that came out of the graves, we're all shocked. Dead men came out of the graves? Wow, shocking, crazy, but why? Like Jesus has already proven that he has the power to give life to mortal bodies when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He's already proven to us. He got there. Lazarus has been dead for several days, so much so that he smells bad. And he gets there, and they're mad at him because he didn't come sooner because he could have prevented them from dying. And they're like, why didn't you come sooner? And Jesus is like, don't worry about it. I'm Jesus. Don't worry about it. But they, weren't, they didn't get that, so they were mad at him. They're like, you don't understand. He's dead, been dead for days. He has no life. And Jesus said, woman, I am the life. In John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And they're starting to get it. He Then after he said, I am the resurrection and the life. So nothing in the Bible is redundant. If, if it says um, sin and iniquity, those two things are often found together in the Bible. It's not redundant. There's a difference between sin and iniquity. There's a difference between resurrection and the life, what it's talking about right here. Okay, so then after he said, I am the life, he then proceeded to revive the dead body of Lazarus to illustrate the sheer power of God, the end all, end all, I am have the power to remove all obstacles from your life even death you guys sometimes we in 2022 living in america we take for granted the power of god because we've heard it our whole lives so yeah he's jesus he's god he he can do anything but do we really believe he can do anything if you really believe he can do anything and there are no obstacles in your life he proved it over and over and over not sickness not blindness not relationship issues, not financial issues. There's no obstacle in your life. But what about death? When we die, we still go to Hades. We still go to the underworld. We still go to this place. He says, not no more. Watch this. He was just telling you guys, he has the power. To, what, did that, what did that preacher say? Because I know I just used a terrible grammar. Not no more. That's bad. I see my sister over there going, holla, you stupid, Shannon. Right? So I see it. I know. I get it. But he said... It may not be good grammar, but it's good preaching. Yeah, that's right. Not no mo. Don't even, don't even finish the word with M-O-R-E. I'm going to say not no more. Not no mo, right? Okay. You got to put some stank on it sometimes. All right. So that's what Jesus is like. I'm removing all of this for you guys. I'm, and you know what? They're still not getting it. They've, they've, they've seen him do all these miracles before, and they're still not getting it. Well, but you missed this one. You missed this one, Jesus. He's already dead. He's been dead for days. And Jesus said, no, I, I, I got it. Open up the tomb. I, I got this. And, and the ladies said to Jesus Christ, you don't understand. They said that to Jesus. They still didn't get it. But I want us to get it here and now. He said, I've already I've raised dead. I've healed blind, I've, the, the lame walk, like you guys, okay, I'll do this too. Wake up! Wake up! Longview, Texas, Gladewater, Hallsville, Gilmer. Somebody please wake Gilmer up. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. I see my, my Gilmer folks right now. I'm just playing. I'm kidding. All right. So, man, he can do anything. And if he can, if he can, Split these rocks open and raise mortal bodies. He's defeated death. You can't, get, you can't beat death. Everybody dies. And Jesus said, you, you do anything that I say. The world yields to me. Satan yields to me. Hell doesn't belong. Hades isn't. Uh, Satan has no, no dominion over his own dominion anymore. I'm that bad. I'm, oh, I'm awesome. And he said, watch. And he raised him, raised him to life. So what's really exactly, what's happening this is a true miracle and symbolic. This is symbolic because a lamb back in the Old Testament is a symbol of meekness because a lamb doesn't resist. 
A lamb just goes wherever you tell it to go. It doesn't resist, so it's easy to sacrifice. In the Old Testament, a slain lamb was the precursor of Christ being crucified. Jesus did not resist his crucifixion. Jesus did not resist his crucifixion. In the same way, the opening of the tombs and their inhabitants coming back to life, it's a small picture of the future of all God's children. The obstacle, the separation between man and God has been broken and removed. And we are all raised back to life. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 We don't have death in store for us anymore because of this. And he's showing us and proving to us what's going on in the underworld right now is just being reflected on the surface of the of the planet right now there's so much shaking and moving going on in hades right now that something's actually happening in the natural i've told you guys the supernatural and the natural are totally linked if you will line up the supernatural with the natural that's when the mountains move in your own life well how do i line up the supernatural with the natural well if you have a vision or a dream or god gives you something in prayer it's in the supernatural it only exists up here or right here it's It doesn't exist on the world, in the world. If you just simply write it down, you have brought the heavenlies into the natural world. And then you begin to act on it, and you put the supernatural at play and at work in your natural life. You want to see the mountains move? Align your supernatural with the natural. That's what was going on here. God does it all through Scripture. He proves his promise by aligning the supernatural with the natural. When you see the earth move based on God's promise, that's what's happening. He's just validating it to us and proving to us that this happens. Okay, so check this out. So we know that Christ went to hell when he died. When he died on Friday, he went to hell. Some folks don't know that. That's shocking. Like, Jesus went to hell? Yeah. Because he, he was bad? No. To forever prove to Satan, you do not have dominion over my people. Jesus said, there will be no gates of hell that will prevail over my church. He went, took the keys of hell from Satan. Some of y'all, some of y'all know this. You never, you you can't escape Hades, the the underworld of the Old Testament that it talks about. Well, in the New Testament too. Speaks of Hades being being the the underworld. We, we, We call it hell, all right? It's not necessarily the lake of fire, uh, but it's it's hell to some degree, okay? So You don't escape that. If you die and you go there, Satan's got you. And Jesus went there. And I'm sure Satan was all too happy. He's like, oh, I got you now, brother. They killed you. I've been wanting to shut you up for 33 years. Finally, they killed you. You're mine now. And Jesus said, oh, you think so? I mean, he probably did like a pow. And I'm out. Like he probably did. I, I don't know. He probably didn't. All right. He probably floated. But. (laughs) <laughs> Since I can't float, you guys got to get this right here. So that's what, that's what it is. Pow. All right. So, so when he walked out of Hades, he didn't just take the keys. He didn't just free himself. That's not all that was happening. He brought everybody with him. That's what was happening. The people of God are no longer subject to Hades when you die. You belong to Jesus Christ now and forevermore. And he proved it to you. He went down there and he said, y'all ready to go? Let's bounce. (laughs) And they left. And he further proved what was going on in the spiritual by letting us see it in the natural too. Oh, you don't don't think that, that I actually raised these people? that were in Hades in the underworld? You don't think that really happened? Well, I'll just show you. I'll do it on earth too, just so you know what was going on. I'll do it on earth too. I'm not just going to let Christians see it. I'm going to send them to Jerusalem, the capital city, where there's hundreds of thousands of people. I'm going to let everybody see them too. And people still don't believe. Are you? That's a wait what moment. If you still don't believe, what? How do you still not believe? That's crazy. Before the resurrection of Christ, all those who had fallen asleep went to Hades. The opening of the graves and the resurrection of the bodies of the saints who were in Hades now signify to all people that not only did Jesus defeat hell in the grave, all his people do too, proving, in fact, he is exactly who he says he is. Oh, this boy is bad. 
If you don't follow Christ, if you haven't given your life up, what are you waiting on, man? I'm telling you, this brother, I'm going back to our series. This brother is bad. We did a whole series about that. I'm like, I just, but he, he's not this little, sweet, little, you know, pet the children and kiss the lambs or the other way around. But uh, <laughs> this, this brother, he owns it all. He created it all. He can do it all. The only thing he can't do is make you follow him. He could probably do that too, but he chooses not to. And there's a good reason. I'm going to tell you real quick. Because whatever obstacle that had previously made it impossible for the spirits of the Old Testament saints to leave Hades and be reconciled with God, by virtue of those graves opening up, it's now removed and the whole world knows it. Matthew 16 says, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. And he proved it by showing them, see, I told you. That victory that happened in the heart of the earth, as we read in Matthew 12, 40, put that one up there. Matthew 12, 40, for, this is Jesus, words in red, for just as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He already told us this is going to happen. This is how awesome Jesus is. He told us, they're going to come for me. They're going to kill me. I'm going to die. I'm going to forever destroy the, the veil. And I'm going to come back in three days. I, he told them all this stuff. The heart of the earth. That victory in the heart of the earth reverberated to the surface. The trembling earth and the rock splitting symbols of the joyful revolution that had been accomplished for all those Old Testament saints in Hades. In other words, there was a big old party happening that shook the earth. Like, the earthquake didn't just happen. Oh, these folks were probably up there just, I mean, oh, that's what caused the earth to, because these folks, Jesus is here. This is proving supernaturally and naturally together. It's, the natural is proving the supernatural. So here's the, here's the, the crux of the whole thing, summary of the whole thing is what this whole thing was about. Death didn't used to be a part of earth. In the, in the uh, Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they, know, they knew no death. They knew no sin. Death entered the world through sin. Therefore, the penalty of sin is death. Death means the separation of God from man. That's what it means. God didn't go anywhere. Through sin, death enters your life and separates you from God. That's what sin does, and that's what death means. The penalty of sin is death. There's forever a separation between man and God. But Jesus made a way for all of us to be reconciled and reconnected directly to God. The veil's torn. You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to, to say seven Hail Marys, and you don't have to pay this much or, or do this. or what. You, you, it's, it's been torn. You just have to believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is and confess with your mouth that he is Lord of your life. And, and you accept the resurrection. And the obstacles have already been removed. We keep fighting battles that have already been won. How dumb. I do it too. But sometimes I just stop and I'm like, I'm like, Shannon, step back a second. Why are you fighting with this person? They're not your enemy. Satan is the enemy. And he's already been defeated. Why are you sitting here spinning in thought and worry and anxiousness? Why is your heart palpitating like crazy because you're stressed out? Do you not know that Jesus already took care of all of this for you? And the only reason why we're worried and upset is because we have not given our trust over to him. Why? After all this, do we still think, I, gotta, I have to take care of it. <sighs> what are we doing? Here's what's really cool, too. Jesus made a way for us to be reconnected directly to God. Christ's death opened the graves. His resurrection destroyed the power of death, the power of sin. He didn't destroy sin. He's God. Why didn't he just destroy sin and then we'd be done with the whole thing? Come on, God. 
Have you ever wondered that? I have wondered that, and I've taken it to God. Like, I have a better plan for all of mankind. Hey, God, why didn't you just destroy sin and then we'd be done with it all? I've wondered that. I'm like, what, what's going on? Because now that I know the word of God and I know my father's voice, I know exactly why he didn't destroy sin. Because he wanted to teach mankind love. It's impossible for someone to love someone without choosing to love someone. If you make them love you, that's not real love. That's abuse. You can't make somebody love you. God knew that. Just the inherent creation, the way that we are made, the way we are formed. He wants you to choose to love him. That's the only place you'll get true agape love, is if you choose to love. Not because you have to love, because you choose to love. And anytime you give man choice, they'll sometimes choose sin. We will sometimes choose our own way. What is sin? Oh, it must be doing drugs. Oh, it must be sleeping around before you're supposed to. Oh, oh, sin. Sin is simply doing it your way instead of God's way. Anything that falls under that category is sin and separates you from God. You have the choice to love God, but you also have the choice to do it your own way. Which, by the way, doing it your own way means you don't love God. If you love me, you would do it my way, the Bible says. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. All right? Christ, who was sinless, voluntarily took your sin. And this is what's the, the last thing that I want you guys to get, is that we always focus and concentrate on the whipping and the torture and the cat of nine tails that thrashed his skin and ripped it off, and he was bloody and beaten and bashed beyond recognition. And we watch the passion of the Christ, and our heart just breaks because of the physical abuse that he took. But what we don't stop and think about was the spiritual abuse and torment that he took. Man, I have enough torment with my own sin. And I only got one or two things that keep coming up. You know, most of us, it, it, you got uh, two or three that you struggle with. If you have a tendency to alcoholism, it kind of, you, you know, you might struggle with the temptation. You know, if you have, uh, you know, it, whatever. I'm not going to list, list all. But you know you. We got two or three that bother us. And the older you get, the more you, 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 you get cleared of those things. The more you follow God, not just chronologically the older you get. The more you follow God, the more you get set free from those things. But we just have two or three, and you know how tough your own sin is. Imagine Jesus said, I'm going to take that sin from you. I'm going to take yours too. I'm going to take yours too. He took all sin for all people on himself. He knew no sin. He didn't ever sin. He had no sin. He was unfamiliar with sin. He doesn't know it. He doesn't know how to deal with it or work with it. He voluntarily took everyone's sin. Way worse than them beating him. We focus on them beating him. What was going on spiritually inside of this man is far worse. He was just tormented by sin. He chose to be, I will, be, I will take your torment, Joseph. I will take your torment. Colton and Ray and Addie and Aunt Judy and Jennifer. I'll, I'll take it on myself. I'll take it, John and Kelsey. I'll take it. You don't have to take it anymore. I'll take it. He was cursed for our sake so that we might be saved from the curse. This is him voluntarily taking this on himself. In this way, he extinguished the penalty of sin for us and made it possible for us to escape the condemnation of our sin. The rocks broken at that moment of death demonstrated that the power of sin to bring death to us was forever broken. And all obstacles to attaining true eternal life, both soul and body, were entirely removed. Death, his death, pardoned us from our sin. Like if you commit a crime and you go to jail, you did it. You, you deserve your penalty. It was a horrible crime that you committed. So you get caught, you go to jail. And then somebody comes in and says, I'm going to pay for that one to get out of jail. And you get pardoned. You didn't deserve it. Somebody just did it. 
you sinned. And Jesus steps in and goes, uh, but I don't want them to have to go through the penalty of sin. I got it. I'm going to pay for it. And so he died. His death allowed us to be pardoned from sin. His resurrection is proof that the payment was accepted. It's proof. The tombs broke open. Matthew 27, 52, they broke open. As a result, there no longer remains any obstacle to anyone being personally delivered from eternal death. No obstacle remains. John 5, 24, and then verse 11, 26. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, Jesus said, has crossed over from death to life and will never die. Let me just say that again because it's for somebody in here today. Jesus said, because of all this, I've made this possible. Whoever hears my word and believes in God who sent me, that person has crossed over from death to life and you will never die. Everybody stand to your feet and let's close out. Praise God. Hallelujah. So you guys, we're going to give you guys a chance to respond to God right now. If you've never brought Jesus into your heart, this message was for you. Don't walk out of here without believing in the resurrection. The obstacle has been removed for you. You have full access to God right now. Right now, you have full access. But sometimes we choose to stay in our tomb. But God wants you to come out of your grave. He wants you to come out of that dead place you've been living. He wants you to come out of that dead marriage. He wants you to come out of that dead relationship. He wants you to come out of that, that dead place of depression and anxiety. Come out of that place, that dead place of stress. Come out of that grave, that place. Because it's a, it's a glorious day when you do. We sang that song early this morning. That's what happens. And if you've, if you've already accepted the Lord in your life, and you're a Christian, I, I encourage you right now, pray something else that you need to come out. What else has, has got its hooks around you that you can be set free from? And give that to God right now. The obstacles have been removed. You just have to believe that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. Who does he say he is? God, the Alpha, the Omega, the Creator, the Beginning, the End. Jehovah Jireh. He's Emmanuel. He's and on and on and on. He's the great redeemer. He's the one that sets you free. He's Jesus. Come on, let's give it to the Lord. Father God, we love you and we praise you. Lord Jesus, you see all these hearts and you're tugging on all these hearts right now. If there's any watching online, if there's any in this building right now that has never asked Jesus into your heart, I want you to Say this prayer with me. I'll help you do it. There's no magic in these words. The supernatural power is in what you're feeling right now. The heart, the Holy Spirit is tugging at you. So if you want to pray this prayer and receive that resurrection and come out of that tomb, you can say it with your mouth. You can say it in the privacy of your own heart. But just let God know right now. Just say anything along these lines. Say, Father God, thank you for touching me today. I lay my own way down because I have sinned. And I've messed up. But I'm through messing up. I choose you today. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I see now that my obstacles have been removed. And I trust that you really did come back from the dead. And therefore, I, too, am raised up by the power of God. God, I plant my feet on you today, and I'll never be the same. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Other church folks, just let God know. God, I, I have something I've been struggling with, and I hadn't laid it down. And you prove today once and for all that you've already removed that. I'm the one that needs to embrace and accept the power that you have and lay that stuff aside and stop worrying about it, being anxious about it, being depressed about it, trying to figure it out in my own power, my own might. I'm going to let you do it today, Lord God. I'm coming out of my grave. I'm calling your name because you called mine and you chose me. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give God a hand clap of praise today. Amen. 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 Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. Do me a favor. If you were blessed by this, pass this down the line. Share this with somebody. Just send them the link right now. And also, uh, hit subscribe. If you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell, you'll help the YouTube channel grow so it can expand to even more people. And also, you'll be notified anytime we upload something new. So, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it blessed you. Y'all have a good day.